Brother Jack, uh, Sister Sharifa, Sister Sika, and we are waiting for the Rita also, uh, and the other presenter, uh, Brother uh, Patrick. Uh, he's not able to make it today. He will present tomorrow. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, this is our small effort uh, to provide to provide platform to our young scholars uh, to share their ideas, to share their work on on anything related to the team. Uh, this time we are focusing on Islam and Malay uh, in the Malay world. Uh, Focus actually is just a, a group of uh, scholars in this region, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, uh, in, we got together in last, in 2012, uh, under the initiative of Professor Osman Baka. Uh, normally our meeting consists of 20 to 30 scholars, uh, they travel, uh, either to Malaysia, I remember last time we did a conference in Palembang and then in Patnyai, last one in Patnyai. We spent uh, three, four days together uh, presenting papers and talking about this. Uh, since 2013, uh, when Prof. Osman moved, moved to Soasis uh, in UBD, so he said he will uh, adopt uh, focus under the, under the university. Then he organized few program uh, and the same team. But now Prof. Osman came back to Malaysia, so we, we restart again uh, project. And due to the pandemic, we um, have to be online. Inshallah, next year we can travel again and meet and talk. Uh, and so mainly this is just a networking among uh, scholars, uh, senior scholars, young scholars. Uh, we have few projects. Uh, one of the projects that we have not uh, implemented yet is to get at least 1,000 scholars from this region who are working on Islamization, who are working on uh, Islam in Malay, and all kind of topics. The so 1,000 active scholars. So we'll start it again. And alhamdulillah, in front of us now, we have Sister Fika, Sister Fitriani, Sister Sharifa, Jack, and the rest of all the, the team. Hopefully, uh, by starting again, we can develop a small group uh, of scholars who are serious looking at uh, Islam in the Malay world, in this region. Uh, Malay world, scholarly mean is Malay Archipelago, nothing to do with Malaysia. So this understood. So our session today, uh, we have uh, five uh, papers, but with us now we have three. Uh, we have uh, our dear brother Jackie Lee Chung Leung. Yeah. Uh, he is from, uh, he's doing Islamic history and civilization in Mr. Malaya. Uh, he is, he, he claims he's from Hong Kong, but both uh, Malay mom, <laughs> Malaysian mothers and <laughs> Hong Kong fathers. And then after that, we have uh, Sister Sharifa, uh, and then we have uh, Sister Sika. Uh, the second, we will start with uh, Brother Jeki, uh, and then Sister Sharifa, and then Sister Sika. I hope uh, another presenter uh, will join us. I will, I will call him. Let me take uh, just one minute to introduce uh, our friend, uh, Brother Jeki Chung Leong Lee. Uh, he is now doing a uh, doctor of philosophy in the Department of Islamic History and Civilization. Uh, his dissertation, that's what written here, The Establishment of Terror Imperialism by Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, Historical and Analytical Studies. Heavy topic. <laughs> uh, he's from, uh, got his master's from Hong Kong University. Uh, and then uh, he has postgraduate diploma from Chinese University. So today, uh, our friend uh, JT will present the topic on the uses, the usage of MIB, Malayu Islam Raja, in Brunei daily life in strengthening the Malayness Islam. So we all have 10 minutes. Uh, I will uh, remind at minute 10, we can still have another two, three minutes. Uh, and then we have a question and answer at the end of the session. Just a reminder, if anything happened to our Zoom, uh, power disruption, or anyone try to disrupt us, just 
take it easy, we will we'll manage. So with uh, full respect, we invite our dear brother Jackie, Jackie to present uh, his paper. Okay, Jackie. Okay, I, I start my presentation and then I share my PowerPoint here. Can you see my PowerPoint? Oh, yes. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm the second time to use this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nice. <laughs> okay. Do you want uh, to enlarge uh, it PowerPoint? Maximize okay. it. Okay. Okay. Apa kabar semua? My name is Chikini. Saya dari Hong Kong, tapi ibu dari Kuching dan bapa dari Penai. Today, I will have presentations on my name is not Penai, Penai, especially the daily life in strengthening the national identity. As originally, I want to show the Malay. Yes, and Islamists, but uh, and later I thought that uh, it might be better to use national identity because the Brunei government tried to uh, create the uh, Brunei and Brunei uh, concept uh, uh, in a throughout the country. <coughs> and yes, uh, we know that uh, Brunei is an old rich state on the northwest side uh, of Borneo Island with a uh, 5,765 kilometers square and an income made up of uh, 450,000 people, mainly Malay and some Chinese, and then the other ways are Bisaya, Black, Pluto, and then the uh, largest area uh, in Brunei is in uh, Brunei Mwala, and they call Dayila. Dayila, uh, Brunei Mwala, Dayila Tutong, uh, Dayila Bright, and Dayila uh, Tampulong. And then uh, the king of the Wula now is Sultan Haji Hassan of uh, Bokhya, who is the uh, son of Sultan Omar Ali Salifuddin and Bangilan uh, Dami. And then uh, the paper of uh, the purpose of this paper is to show how the Brunei government embodies the concept of MIB uh, or uh, Malayu is not Belajia in the daily life with two examples. And then uh, the first example will uh, will be the name place of shops and streets. And the second example is the management of cultural heritage. Uh, as we know that Brunei is uh, on a country uh, a rich country, but we need that uh, they need to post up their economy by showing their national identity in front of the foreigner and especially they want to preserve the uh, Brunei culture so that uh, they, they, they know and understand that the traditional culture is very important to the country and no one should not uh, damage the, on them. Uh, here I want to uh, give a brief history of Brunei and uh, House of Bokia and uh, here over the seventh century since Sultan Mohammed Star or uh, our Alapadata uh, founded uh, in uh, 40th century and uh, most near to the dynasty in, uh, in China correspondingly. And then uh, Brunei's uh, territory is reached to the page, uh, especially after Sultan Salif Ali to Sultan, Sultan Bokia in the uh, 15th century to 16th century, they and even more and most of the whole uh, parts of Borneo Island and reach to uh, South uh, Filipina. Even the, uh, the royal member ha have <coughs> married some uh, princes to uh, Kingdom of Manila uh, in Filipinas uh, to show their uh, national power that uh, around Southeast Asia. But uh, Brunei, uh, unfortunately, uh, after a wrath of European in 16th century, they also faced with the foreign trade, especially Spanish civil war, especially the Dutch people in 17th century, they want to expand the, uh, the uh, scale of interest in Southeast Asia. Uh, but for the need, uh, the Dutch people and Portuguese uh, were fail to occupy or even establish the sphere of interest in Brunei lately. Uh, however, uh, during 17th century, Good night, uh, also the, the financial dollar or super war and, uh, as the Cho Sudan, as Sudan Ato Hako Mumin and Sudan Wuyin, uh, were struggling for the, uh, throne, uh, in Brunei. And so, uh, they seek the, the Saba, the Cho Sudan, the, uh, of Sunu. And they, it marked the beginning of, uh, decline uh, in Brunei. In 19th century, the arrival of British, uh, started their protectorate uh, ruling and even the residence uh, system. 
Islam and in Brunei, and during Sultan Hassim Jalilu Alam Akademati and Muhammad Jamal Alam at uh, Katwa. And then in 1959, Sultan regained uh, the constitutional power uh, with the signature of the uh, of agreement with uh, British government. And first, Sultan Omani Salifuddin started the Brunelization or a uh, pin Brunelian plan. Uh, they brought up the economy by constructing a lot of the infrastructure and, uh, uh, to improve the living standard uh, in Brunei and thus uh, the birth rate in Brunei at the time uh, get, uh, were getting increased at the, at the time in 1984. <coughs> and most before independent, uh, uh, the Brunei uh, signed a tra- treaty with Britain and then uh, to agree uh, to hand over the power uh, to Sultan Omani in 2015. And then uh, MIT stands for <coughs> the National Philosophy. Uh, in Brunei uh, government, they define millennial as uh, some aspect. The first aspect uh, is to uh, define uh, them by different units in, in uh, Brunei, especially uh, the seven major troops, or they, uh, they call Buhati uh, in Brunei. And then uh, they also brought the culture from Indian, China, Arab, Java, and Europe in the past to show the permissiveness of culture in Brunei. And then uh, Islam defined for the Ahadith Sunnah Wajama and, and they follow the uh, Matub to uh, they as they have been, uh, they used to be the colony of uh, British government. So they learned the institutionalizations on the Islam affair. So you and we can see that the uh, the Islamic Institute ha- uh, has been uh, well re- uh, developed at the time. But just stand for House of Bokia, and he is the national leader. He is the religious leader and also the protector of non-Muslim. But it's little similar to the Halifa system uh, in Islam uh, politics. So, uh, Sunan Omari Sanfuddin uh, has said that Brunei is and uh, with the blessing of Allah should be forever a uh, sovereign, democratic, and independent Malay Muslim monarchy. So, this is the, uh, could be regarded as the Bruneian first policy. The war of MIB is just shaped uh, the Brunei's national identity clearly in front of the throne uh, to preserve the memory cultural heritage to protect the living space of Brunei and to prevent the cultural evolution from outside. And the last point, and uh, not so many scholars have pointed out that, but uh, uh, with the uh, arrival of globalization, uh, it becoming more uh, obviously uh, recently. And then uh, the, now I will show the first example. And, and if the foreigner uh, or the visitor uh, arrived to Brunei and then they will discover uh, of Jarvis writing uh, on the streets or from the shops, it is an official writing. Not so many South uh, Malay country will continue to use uh, Jarvis writing uh, uh, now because the Malay people uh, uh, regularly uh, uh, give up, uh, gave up the Jari writing in 19th century due to the business purpose and for the communication with other race, uh, accompanied with the arrival of different uh, uh, race uh, from the China and India. <coughs> the arrival of Europeans and immigration race from China reduced the uses of Jari for the communication. And Brunei uh, is still adhering to instruct Jari writing as one of the learning posts in the school. Uh, to show that uh, you, you can see the Brunei uh, uh, their strong determination to use the uh, Jawi writing. <coughs> the, uh, this photo, <coughs> some are uh, 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 kept from internet and some are uh, uh, taken the photo from my uh, trip in the, la- uh, in the la- uh, last few years as I have been to Brunei several years ago and, and I have taken photo from them as they basically come to Syria, Syria and then uh, China City of Palawan and uh, actually they, uh, they were not, on, they are on, not only to show the uh, documentation of preserving Jami wedding but also uh, Invoice some story, especially uh, such as City of Palawan, to show that Malay people uh, were very uh, admitted to the uh, cure because they told that uh, men is uh, have duty to protect the country and they should also loyal to the country. And this can be explained by uh, Malay state usually uh, uh, defined as small 
uh, but we can say in the past, they need to find a strongest figure to protect their country. So in, uh, in the day they like, we can see some uh, nature uh, figure, you know, such as Hantuan also uh, like uh, this example. And then, and not, not only of this, but uh, we can see that the uh, preservation of uh, Chiang Wei Tang and then the Malay uh, culture can, can be seen on the uh, street name. In the in Brunei, there are lot, lot, lots of different uh, types of road name. Some uh, could be referred as the leader, uh, the honorary of the leader, such as Jalan Sultan Omar Ali Saifuddin. It connects up with Liberalia Sultan Haji Hasan Abokia. And then Raja is telling Bandila and the Salaha that this uh, was to show the respect of Brunei government for this person because they had contracted to the independence of Brunei. Second, the nature the story. Uh, for example, Nakota Man is to show that uh, we need to uh, show our values and uh, attitude to um, our parents because it's reflect that uh, a son uh, had treated her and uh, his mother unwell and then uh, the son had uh, uh, got punishment from the god at last <clears throat> and the China also been uh, reflect that uh, Brunei had a uh, cultural connection with China especially in Fujian uh, provinces uh, history of purpose and uh, being hospital now used to be the uh, protectorate or the residency system under the British government. So they uh, chose to name the street as Elizabeth Dua. Giant Party stands for the Brunei residents uh, or the leader at the time. It's not mean, it's not mean some people are uh, very beautiful. It's the name only. And the indicative uh, Brunei uh, Evoking the people to use Bahasa Malayu widely in the daily life. So you can see that uh, Utamakan Bahasa Malayu or Bahasa Malayu, Bahasa Rasmi Nakala on the street. And some religious uh, Javi Wattin can also be seen on the road while you are driving along the road, such as Bahadana, Ahabdulillah, or Alam Pabat. These are the religious uh, white kings uh, in Brunei. Second, and the second example is the management of museum. Uh, uh, as Brunei uh, is uh, an oil-rich country, and so uh, they need to uh, define uh, their country as a multi-dimensional uh, uh, state. Uh, other than oil-rich, they also need to uh, de- uh, show their uh, national identity in front of the foreign- foreigner. For example, the uh, museum. We can learn some history from the museum while we are arrived to Brunei. About 28% of Bruneian people are working in tourism related sector. For example, the uh, restaurant, the hotel management, or even the, uh, the transportation. Uh, other than orange, they also need to uh, uh, work for the tourism related sector. Every museum or historical site can make consist Malayan, Islam, or Belgium, or two of them or both, such as Kotabato, uh, Gambo RA, and Black Museum. They are quite a representative example. Kotabato is an two, old. Two minutes. Mm? Okay. Uh, okay. Kotabato is an old business city in ancient Brunei Kingdom. Sudan Sali Ali uh, built with Chinese people and spread Islam here. According to Sili Salah, Raja Raja Brunei. A uh, lot of cons and commodities are, were found here. Gampo uh, 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 can uh, be described as a small history book of people. Now. We can discover a lot of Malay culture here, especially the traditional job, especially the uh, uh, Islamic culture, and also the Borneo value, because Gampo uh, uh, is a, a, a traditional culture in Borneo and uh, according to the uh, specialists. And then, uh, Black Muslim, because the government wants to preserve the primitive people, black people is uh, 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 local people, indigenous people yeah, in Brunei, and they want to preserve the uh, local culture and also to praise the social contribution of Chinese people, because there are a lot of Chinese people residing here until now. And then these are the representation of my uh, paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sana Kasim. Thank you, thank you, Brother Jackie. It's a very interesting topic. Uh, mm. Now Brunei is uh, under the radar. 
because uh, their uh, aggressiveness to implement Islam in their own, in their own style. We know yeah. that the term that Brunei Brunei or Brunei Brunei <laughs> so we know about that. So uh, scholars and observers are uh, moni- uh, monitoring uh, Brunei progress uh, very closely uh, to see what they want to do with with their yeah. unquote uh, Islamic uh, background. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a few questions for you at the end. Okay. Uh, Thank you. With us. So our next uh, presenter is our dear uh, Sister Sharifa. Uh, Nurul Huda, uh, our sister uh, got his ma- her master from Istek. Uh, 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 her writing is on concept of halal bait in the Sunni and Shia literature in Malaysia. Now she is uh, pursuing her PhD, and this is among her work. So she, uh, uh, sister Nurul Huda will be presenting on the topic of Kemudis is one of the organization. Persuan of Muslim identity and its Asian to Malaysian presents the general. All right. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Brother Moderator and the Organizing Committee for this meaningful conference. Um, and without further ado, Assalamualaikum. Allow me to begin with Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. All right. Kemudis Persuans of Muslim Identity and its implications to Malaysian Muslim. Right, firstly, what is Kemudi? Kemudi stands for Persatuan Kesedaran Melayu dan Islam or the Malay and Islamic Awareness Association. As its name offers, the Malaysian-based NGO aims at championing a type of Muslim identity in Malaysia. But what is Muslim identity? I'm not going to detail on the classical or indigenized Muslim identity. I'll go straight to the Malaysian context. <laughs> right. In Malaysian context, uh, Muslim identity is coined in the federal constitution as a requisite of being a Malay. Scholars like Kim Hyo Lim and Wan Nur Hasniah attribute Budi and Budi Islam to accentuate Malay quality. Others, like our Prof. Osman and Zakaria Stapa, express their concerns on threats such as globalization, feminism, homosexuality, pluralism that befall the identity. Not only that, Prof. Osman worries that this identity is experiencing progressive weakening of its Malay Islamic character due to society's preference to sentimental sentiments rather than intellectual response to the issue. Another scholar, Ahmad Fauzi, observed that at present, religion enjoys more value as the Malay identity determinant. So, well, I would say um, Islam being Malay's official religion and the message of truth may succumb to efforts of more and more motivations to accentuate its requisite of Malay identity, and such efforts is realized by, among others, Kabudi. Okay, now let's look at the origin of Kabudi. Um, Kabudi believes that the Muslim identity has been degraded by colonialism that introduces liberal democracy and capitalism to replace Malay monarchy. To restore it, Kemudi was established in 2013 out of the Lajah Mashhur's resolution. All right, next, mission and vision of the organization. Uh, Kemudi has laid down precisely seven objectives, which will be too long for me to share, but three elements summarize them, Islam, the chosen Malayness, and the glory of Malay kinship. Kamudi's mission is to share knowledge and achieve mutual understanding of their models uh, uh, entitled 10 Malay Pillars of Quranic Values. The focus of this study, the third pillar, al al the Malay world, is especially related to biological identity of a Malay Muslim vis-a-vis 
restoring the forgotten Malay uh, of prophetic value, Malay origin of prophetic value. So in short, as far as Muslim identity is concerned, it aims to uphold the chosen Malay generation, or in Malay they call it Melayu Mustafa Wiyah. All right. In leadership, Kemudi functions in a top-down structure. The founder chairperson, Tun Suzana Tun Haji Osman, is a Malay with prophetic descent. Leadership style seems autocratic, but the charisma makes it highly effective. Kemudi at the moment has no substitute levels. So far, no information on membership application. The committee seems to be among close relatives and members, and Kemudi is mostly self-funded. At times, they also calls for the donations. Right, let's look at the strategy and tactic. All right, strategically, Kemudi uses virtual communication platform. Kemudi's Facebook followers experienced a steady increase from 5,000 in June 2019, reaching to 6,000 in April last year, and soared up to 10,000 plus by March this year. Um, its most important strategy is upholding al as the prerogative of Malay Muslim identity. So if anyone does have had no idea of what al is, al is the family of the prophet from biological origin, from the blood relation. So, so this al recognizing them as preachers and savior in this region is the strategy that uh, Kemudi uses to boost its uh, applicable applicability to the public. So it allies with other NGOs like Gabung and Mikraj. All right, when I, when I say Mikraj, it reminds me of J Brother Jackie's uh, presentation just now because Mikraj stands for Malay Islam Baraja, which pulled more than 400 Muslim NGOs together. And also Israq, Ikma, Amin, just to name a few. So uh, Kemudi tactical moves include series of lectures following its module and publication. There are also religious cultural activities uh, such as mass litanies hosted or joined by the organization. It also established connection with Malay community outside Malaysia, as you can see in the slide. I would say the effectiveness of such strategical and tactical initiatives grab the attention of Malay Muslims partly because it champions the sentiment of Malay supremacy. All right, these are some of the publications written by the chairperson herself. She was quite prolific, I would say. And uh, these are examples of mass litanies that the NGO joined or organized. Now let's look at Kemudi's Muslim identity, the origin. Um, Kemudi emphasizes Ahlul Bayt presence, uh, Ahlul Bayt presence in the Malay royal blood as early as the Malaccan period. Uh, important person like Mani Purindam as having probability of Arab Persians aristocracy from Abbasid lineage. So since Abbasid equals Ahl Bayt, and another that they uh, highlight is Tun Habib Abdul Majid, and finally Syed Hussein Jamadil Kubro, uh, the first Ahl Bayt patriarch in the Malay world. And his descendants were among the nine Wali Songos. So as far as the characteristic is concerned, assimilation between prophetic lineage and Malay is well accepted and considered a blessing. But how is it so? Um, more, more, uh, sorry, Malay royals have significant titles and some Malays have surnames signifying the lineage, such as one in Kelantan and Tengganu, also Nick and Long, as well as Mio for male, de male descendants in Spera. So uh, let's look at uh, the justification. Why is that so? 
Nobody argues that not only that they are noble, their validity is in line with Islamic political jurisprudence. As the hadith says, the leader is from Quraysh. Another justification is Malays, generally known as the people of the East, are saviors to Ahli Bayt, whose champion will be Al Mahdi. Kumudi believes that the present turmoil necessitates early preparation for the Malays. Firstly, to prepare for Islamic revivalism, and then to prepare for the coming of the awaited Al Mahdi and the handover of the black flag. Black flag, sorry. Looking at the formation of such Malay Ahlul Bayt identity, it is evident that Kumudi takes high pride in being a Malay Muslim of such video. Now let's look at the implication which are analyzed through their political, organizational, and religious integrity. These sectors are chosen because they are models and vision in the national integrity plan. plan sorry. MIP is, is necessary in the formation of nation nation as envisioned in Vision 2020 later on to be incorporated in National Transformation 2015. As a civil organization, national integrity should be part of Komodi's conscious liability. Currently, the level of awareness and public appreciation of NIP is relatively low. Analyzing it through the sectors should enlighten the study to understand implication of such identity to the Malaysian Muslims. Now let's look at the political implication of political integrity. Political integrity refers to one's loyalty towards mainly a state's constitution and the king as proclaimed the third principle of Rukun Negara. So how Kamudi handles it? Kamudi's mission solidified the Malayness in the name of safeguarding the religion of Islam and the Malay royals as descendants of Ahlul Bayt. So in other words, the identity pursued by Kamudi is highly consistent with loyalty to the national constitution and philosophy. What about uh, implication on CSO integrity? So the agenda of CSO in, uh, includes empowering integrity within and among organizations through their contributions and cooperation with government and private sectors. Their roles are significant in pursuing human rights, raising awareness and environmental issues and organizing religious and cultural activities, among others. So Kamudi champions national integrity as far as the privilege of the Malay Muslim are concerned. However, the persons of identity seems to discount integrity with other non-Malay Muslims. So let's see the last point. Implication of religious integrity. As a multi-ethnic Malaysia acknowledges religious freedom, although Islam is the official religion, basically all religion emphasizes integrity in their philosophy and teachings, and it plays an important role to maintain cooperation, understanding, and mutual respect between their followers. Well, as far as religious integrity is concerned, Kamudi promotes inner dimension of religiosity, but deeper analysis of their missions seems to entail a challenge to Islam, Islam, racial equality, and brotherhood. Finally, allow me to explain only my conclude, first concluding point. In my humble opinion, this is a kind of Muslim identity with immunity, meaning it is a Malay Muslim identity with doses of Arab Islamic prophetic nobility known as Ahlul al-Bayt, family of the prophet. The identity with this added value is being pursued as religiously significant and ethnically privileged to serve political, religious, and social pursuits, definitely with its share of positive and negative implications as briefly discussed before. With this, I thank you. And I'm, it's my pleasure to hand over to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Sharifa. It is such a, a heavy and <laughs> presentation.
uh, although it's about an organization, uh, but the philosophy, uh, the objective, and the mission, uh, it is uh, very crucial. Uh, now we go to uh, our next presenter. Uh, I, I realized that Sister Rita just uh, logged in, but we'll, she will present after this. Uh, we go first to Sister Fika. Uh, Sister uh, Nurul Fika will present on towards the renewal of Islamic art, examining Western influences and responses in Islamic, uh, Islamic uh, Malaysian contemporary art. Sister Fika uh, obtained her master's uh, from UK and bachelor's uh, from ITM. Uh, he is currently uh, doing her PhD. Right. So without further ado, we invite our guest, Jessica, to present her paper. Thank you, Brother Shahran. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And a very good afternoon to all dear friends. Inshallah, today I will be presenting about the renewal of Islamic art, examining Western influences and responses of in contemporary Islamic art in Malaysia. Okay. Well, basically, um, my research would like to um, explain about how Islamic practices have changed from traditional times and how it has received um, mixed responses, particularly um, uh, with skepticism from Islamic scholars. Uh, so in particular, we have Bukhtar, Nasar and Alin, who believe that um, modern art uh, derived from a Western tradition is based on subjectivism, individualism, and psychology impulses of the painter, and thus, they believe that this is incompatible with Islam and the practice of traditional Islamic art. Additionally, uh, they also believe that the favor of psychological expression contradicts with the purpose of Islamic art. Okay, so for my research, I have a question that I wanted to ask. And that is how do Muslim artists deal with Western artistic modes in representing Islamic spirituality through art? And can modern and postmodern artistic modes be compatible with Islamic art? We have heard from some of our presenters just now, such as Brother Apaslan, who um, explained about the compatibility between Islam and modernity as well as the differences between modernity in the West and modernity in Islam. Uh, so in the context of my study, I um, would like to present my findings uh, that I had from the study of two Malay Muslim artists who presented uh, modern and postmodern art trends while at the same time, we're very conscious about the Islamic spirituality of their practice. So before I go into um, the analysis of the two artists, uh, I would like to explain a bit more about traditional arts and why uh, traditional art in particular holds a lot of value for uh, in Islam. So if you look at this picture in front of you, these are some samples of traditional art forms. For Al-Faruqi, traditional art forms um, is uh, basically has a universal characteristics across the globe. So wherever um, we find Islamic art, there will be some similarities. And uh, these similarities include Tawhidic expressions. So art that was produced during this time had a very clear message and a clear purpose, and that is to create a contemplative uh, environment so that viewers will be reminded of God. Additionally, for Al-Faruqi, um, the aesthetic principles that was employed uh, to create these artworks are based from uh, the principles of the Quran itself. So he has outlined some of this, including abstraction, modular structure, successive combination, repetition, uh, dynamism, and intricacy that is reflective of the Quran's literary style. But 
um, come modernism, especially due to colon, uh, colonialism, we witness a few changes in the form and practice of Islamic art. So we have traditional crafts such as the one I illustrated earlier. And then um, in the 1930s onwards and in the 1950s, more Western modes of art has been introduced and practiced due to uh, education received abroad. Um, but uh, we also witness a return or a, 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 a consciousness for Islamic identity and Malay identity from in the 1970s after um, after the um, May 13, 1969 uh, event. So due to that event, there was a, an effort from the government to rediscover what it means, uh, uh, what national identity means. So there are several things outlined uh, during this conference, particularly that um, the national culture must be based on indigenous culture of the region, Suitable elements of other cultures can be assimilated to the national culture. Islam is as an, as an important element of national culture. So during this time, artists in Malaysia were a bit more conscious about this and attempted to, as we can say, decolonize um, arts uh, and art practices. However, without um, abandoning the training that they have received from the West. Additionally, at the same time, during the era, we also witnessed the Islamic resurgence that took place in Iran and also new economic policy uh, that was implemented by the government uh, to, uh, to, uh, to raise the economic um, status of the Malay. So due to these three events especially, um, the, the landscape of the Malaysian art uh, and Islamic art has been shaped. Okay, so we have modern Western centric modes. At the same time, I would also like to explain about postmodern modes and I will go a little bit more in detail about the differences between the two. But basically, um, postmodern modes uh, refers to an era after the effects of NEP. So during this era, Malays are more educated, uh, but they still receive education uh, from the West, uh, but they have become a bit more critical about the narratives, the meta-narratives that they receive. Okay, so in the 1980s, we see a lot of uh, modern art and the search for Malay Islamic identity. So during this era, the main concern was about decolonizing art and also uh, to explore the harmony between Malayness and Islam. However, at the same time, artists still employ Western abstract expressionism. And we, instead of utilitarian arts and crafts, such as the wow or the labu sayong or um, uh, architecture, we see an inclination towards art that are produced for the gallery. So stuff like uh, canvas painting and sculptures and emphasis on uh, formalist aesthetics. But at the same time, due to this consciousness, we can see how these artists try to integrate between their traditional identity and also the modern uh, Western education that they had received. But when we go to 1990s onwards, um, we see a different pattern that has emerged. Postmodern modes, where the main concerns of the artist is not anti-modern, but to reflect on the ongoing social and cultural changes uh, parallel to modernization in Malaysia, and also to challenge meta-narratives and uh, to raise democratic ideals and social issues. So these were the main concerns of the artists. And what characterized their works is a shift as well in the things that you use, they used to make their artwork. So uh, instead of being limited to just paintings, there are new artistic modes that emerge, uh, such as serigraphy, installation, and for some artists, they even uh, proceeded towards more anti-aesthetic trends. Okay, so I will explain and analyze two different artists, one representative of modernism, uh, modern art, and the other one representative of postmodern art. Okay, the first artist is Sir Ahmad Jamal, 
uh, Sheikh Ahmad Jamal received his education mostly uh, from the West. He is Western trained, uh, but through his biography, we can see, and as well from his the analysis of his artwork, that he considers his art as contemporary with an Islamic soul. So this is one of the art, uh, artwork that, has, that he had produced in 1998. So based on the analysis, we can find influences of abstract expressionism. So uh, the style that was used was different from the ones that we saw in traditional art. He did not use arabesque. He did not use calligraphy. Uh, but instead, he used colors, paints, brush strokes, shapes in order to convey a spiritual message. So in a way, we can also see that there is a process, a process of denaturalization. This does not go against the majority of the Fokaha opinion regarding art. So there is no figurative drawing. There's no depiction of three-dimensional space. In terms of content, we see that his works are Quran inspired. Uh, he also uh, create artworks that are inspired by the works of poet, uh, poets poets uh, and Muslim thinkers as well as current events. And for him, his approach is more universal. For him, uh, there is no specific language that he used except for a universal language and his Islamic message should be uh, able to be appreciated by uh, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. So this was uh, his focus. But going back to the critiques against modern art uh, by uh, especially proponents of traditional art who are a bit skeptic uh, of uh, skeptical of uh, modern art, uh, I've outlined here some of the major arguments, uh, general arguments. So first, uh, the main concern regarding modern art is the fact that um, artists tend to center themselves instead of being God-centered. So uh, most of the time, modern artists produce artworks because they wanted to express themselves and their feelings and their, their psychological condition. So, but in the case of Sheikh Ahmad Jamal, we can see that his concern was to express God's majesty, except that he uses a different visual expression. Uh, in regards to modern psychologism, of course, these artworks are also quite um, expressive uh, but they express um, the, the artist's um, feelings in a way that would be beneficial uh, in, from the Islamic uh, perspective. Uh, I think I also want to uh, address here uh, that in most traditional arts, uh, artists remain anonymous because they believe that anonymity is one of the ways for them to um, uh, or center God's greatness. So for them, uh, when a beautiful object is created, it's the work of God and it's not their work. So they, don't, they do not want to take credit for that. And that's also one of the um, concerns that scholars have, Islamic scholars have in regards to the practice of art today. Um, there's also the argument of arts for art's sake, but as we can see, art is not the end for um, Sayyid Ahmad Jamal. For him, it's a form of da'wah. But there is one concern that has left uh, unaddressed um, if we look from the utilitarian, utilitarian point of view. Uh, these artworks served as um, a gallery artworks, but uh, at the same time, they have uh, opened platform, platforms for dialogue and discussion and also shared uh, about Islam uh, with the viewers. So the second artist that I would like to address is... There? Okay, sorry. Inshallah, I'll make it quick. Okay, the second artist that I would like to um, share about is uh, uh, Sulaiman Issa. So his work, uh, I also want to mention that Sulaiman Issa was a student of uh, Ismail Al-Faruqi and also Said Hussein Nasar. And we can see the influences of these sco uh, two scholars' thoughts in his work. I will discuss more about this artwork, inshallah. So this artwork, uh, titled Endangered Garden, uh, is a response uh, of the 9-11 events uh, when Muslims uh, have been uh, painted uh, by the mass media as terrorists. So this is his response as, a response as an artist uh, regarding this issue. So his postmodernism approach um, involves uh, the use of different kinds of media as well as uh, to appropriate some of this uh, popular culture symbolisms that we can find in American culture. So in this artwork, we can see uh, that the structure uh, and the media is actually based on traditional Malay art. Uh, there's a, a 
the uh, practice of anyaman. There are some patterns. There's uh, the mandala in the center. Uh, and it is also a very beautiful form of criticism. So we can see Malay aesthetics being employed even when the artist wanted to address, uh, you know, a, a very uh, critical uh, issue. And this is also another artwork um, that uh, the artist produced. So in postmodern art, the writing some postmodern art uh, from the Islamic perspective is still quite scarce. So there needs to be a bit more research about this. But there are two issues uh, that has been the major concerns uh, for um, Muslims. And that is the question of ethics and the idea that um, re reality is always being uh, relativized. Okay, so in conclusion, we can see that these are um, valuable efforts that has been put forward by two different artists uh, from two different um, kinds of art styles. And they um, dealt with Western methods and had managed to effectively um, convey more Islamic and spiritual um, messages. Uh, however, there are a few things that uh, can still be taken into consideration for uh, further studies. And these are the emerging trends of contemporary art. Because uh, uh, nowadays, arts, there are different kinds of arts and some of them are a bit anti-aesthetic. So more research needs to be made uh, how this sits in relation to um, Islam. Okay, How does the role of tradition play in contemporary art practice? This is also something that needs to be uh, further studied. And when I mention tradition, I don't simply mean uh, just um, the use of visual means, but also the practice itself, Okay, the, the artistic, uh, artistic process itself. And should we consider for classification of contemporary Islamic art to make sense of you know, the, the, the values that they have and the status that they have uh, in relation to uh, Islam. Thank you, Brother <laughs> Shahran. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sister Fika uh, is an artist herself. So um, we look forward for your, uh, your career, they call it, <laughs> your own um, artistic uh, expression, combination of these two great scholars, inshallah. So uh, I think Sister Rita is here, is it? Sister Rita, can, can you unmute yourself? Rita Pus Rita Sari. I think that she is uh, she's here in, um, in our meeting room. Not uh, replying. Okay, then while waiting for Sister Rita, there are questions for uh, Jack. Uh, there's a Rita here. Uh, okay. There's a long question by Brother Nuruddin. Uh, can you answer that, uh, Jackie? On, on the uh, chat? Okay. Uh, I, I, I answer my question first. Oh, yours. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for regarding to Ms. Nurutin say that uh, can you explain further uh, about the contents of the emergency of MIP per se? Uh, was it the, uh, during the British colonial era in Brunei that was a systematic attempt to remove the German technique from the public sphere and then replace it with English? Uh, actually, if we are talking about the uh, working of uh, Islam institutionalization, uh, the Malay Islam pleasure uh, will be imagined uh, since the arrival of uh, Islam in Bona and even the, uh, in the Sultan Salif Ali. But if we are talking about the generation of the concept, it might be uh, in the modern period of time because uh, the Brunei government has uh, witnessed the arrival of uh, European power, especially British government, and they want to preserve uh, the tradition Malay Islam uh, culture. They, uh, so they uh, are generally, uh, uh, gen uh, uh, gradually, gradually uh, uh, form the concept of Malay Islam to preserve the traditional uh, 
local culture. They want to defend their uh, their local culture. They were proud of their uh, Brunei national identity. They do that. They do that. Uh, Brunei is uh, also a, a good country, and they help other people to learn their culture better. And then, uh, moreover, MIP is also a kind of the. Uh, uh, Maybe to politically talk to, uh, to protect Brunei from other country or even the cultural emotion because, uh, the Brunei government too that, uh, they want to prevent or avoid the other cultural emotion again from the foreign country, especially under uh, the era of globalization. They hope the Brunei culture would be better, to, uh, preserved by the, uh, the ruler to the people. They also want to show their, and, uh, and, uh, uh, Brunei culture in front of the foreign country. Other than the oil rich, uh, eco- uh, economy, they want to transfer their economy as soon as possible, refer to the Middle East, uh, such as Qatar or even UAE. They also want to shape their race culture in front of the foreign country to bring more profits and uh, to improve the government uh, income too. Okay. Okay. Uh, I still ask. I still want to call this uh, Sister Rita. She's here. Sister, can you connect? Okay. Okay. There's one more question from Brother Nuruddin. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you okay, Sister Rita? Yes, Mister Kasim. Uh, can you present? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Oh, okay, nice. Thank you. Okay, let me introduce Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kasim. Uh, you, can, you can show your slide while I introduce you first, just for one minute. Uh, we have with us uh, Sister okay. Rita Kusvitasari. Uh, she is from Siduarjo, East Java. Uh, she obtained her... Uh, Bachelor's and Master's from Institute of the IRN Tulang Agong. Tulang Agong, is it? Yes, right. Now he is doing, uh, 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 he got his both uh, master, uh, Bachelor's and Master's from, from the same university. So, uh, Sterita will be presenting uh, on the topic of um, Ta'lim Halata in Mental Development and Planting of Religiosity Student at IAN Pulang Agong East Java, Indonesia. Yes, Go ahead. Thank you for your Today, I will be presenting about development and planting of religious city students in said Islamic Institute of Tulungagung, Indonesia. Okay, about Ta'lim Halako. Regarding the term Ta'lim Halako, it is something that is related to the world of education or learning activities carried out in the group. Halako is an Nothing more than just a group interaction in learning, especially Islamic education or teaching. Uh, in the Arabic, the name is the term same with Tarbiya al Islamia. The designation as a learning circle is usually used to describe a group of people or several people who form small groups. Consisting of several people who form small groups. Certain example is Islamic teaching in depth. The number of participant groups consists between 8 to 12 people for the Talim Halakha group and can be larger than that number. The, the study Islam in Halakha learning groups with a specific manhaj or curriculum obtained from their parents' organization or groups are usually curriculum come from Murabi and Nakib. Murabi and Nakib called to teach in the Talim Halako and then who get in from congregation who offer 
also called mentoring, guidance, and At the time, the freedom of association has reached an alarm level as many as 63% of adolescents have had They called KTAE, and the Ministry of Health conducted a survey in October 2013 reported from and competent data. The first ever percentage is very concerning and attract attention. Moreover, that is the an approach in the relationship that are not yet all valid. The research question from this Paper, the first, how is the learning of Ta'anim Halaka in mental development of the Islamic Institute of Tulungagung for students? And the second, how is learning of Ta'anim Halaka in the cultivating the religiosity of IAI and Tulungagung students? And the third, what are factors that influence mental development and the cultivation of religiosity of um a is of the best to form human morals in order to have a and character so it's quite the difference the a counter measure against the current of criminal acts and formation to the functions Our song will give it with man is the best on the one and One hundred and four. So we lost your PowerPoint. Okay, I think uh, while waiting for Sister Rita to come back, uh, we'll take the second question for Sister Sharifa from Brother Nuruddin regarding uh, from the chat, Sister Sharifa. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Nuruddin, for your thoughtful comparison. But actually, it's best to, to ask the community itself. But inshallah, I will forward the question whenever I have chance to do it, uh, to ask the chairperson personally. But if I may answer the questions according to my understanding, uh, does Malay and Ansar, does Malaysian is as Ansar? Well, it's not just Ansar. They view Malay as uh, superior than just Ansar. They are the saviors of Ahlul Bayt because some of them have blood relation to Ahlul Bayt. So Kemudi subscribes, I mean, uh, to the hadith of, uh, uh, from Abu Ibn Mas'ud, like, um, the people of my household, that is Ahlul Bayt, Ahl Bayt, will face calamity, expulsion, and exile after I am gone, that the Prophet gone. Until some people will come from the East carrying black banners. So these people of the East is uh, believable to be the Malays. So that is how Kamudi sees it. So the Malays are subject to preparations of this uh, revivalism, we say. 
So if you're comparing it with the uh, Ethiopian, like the Habash, the Habasha, uh, they don't see the Habasha, the Ethiopian people, uh, with uh, an Najashi. They are Christians, Orthodox Christians, right? So they don't. I, I think this is not really relatable. I mean, they see themselves as Muslim, not like uh, Christian. So maybe not. My observation, maybe I think it's not really compatible with uh, perceiving yourself as a Habsha, you know, like the uh, kingdom of Habsha. Uh, uh, this is my answer. How about your take of, of India's question about the, the claim? Oh, okay. about the, uh, All right, the claim, the whether it is valid or not. Okay, actually, uh, Prof. Imtiaz uh, is my reader of my proposal, so he knows well this uh, 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 this uh, thesis that I'm doing. So, actually, he's not the only one who doubts the claim. So, organizations that study the genealogical tree of Prophet's family like Maktab Dabitul Ansab and Ashraf, I also study Ashraf, reject the Silsilah of Stone Habib Abdul Majid, uh, which uh, they claim, Kemudi claim, as coming from uh, Said Idrus from Hadramaut. So the Ashraf and these uh, organizations, uh, they say that they, this Kemudi doesn't double check with them first. So but uh, the chairperson said that he has, she has her own evidences, you know, like uh, proof that this fella is indeed from uh, the Hadramaut like, uh, lineage. So I'm not into that, um, you know, uh, arguments. I'm just highlighting how they pursue that kind of Muslim identity. That's all. It's difficult. You got a long one from Mother Nuruddin. I don't want to read it. with take time. Can you just respond to it? Yes, yes, inshallah. Uh, thank you, Brother Nuruddin. Uh, you raised uh, some very interesting points in your question. Um, you asked here um, if art, basically, I guess in general, can carry out the negotiation process. Uh, uh, personally, I believe that that is the case. Art uh, has is it uses a, a, a universal language and it is able to convey something um, uh, without using too many words. And there has been very a lot of cases where um, artworks have prompt questions uh, uh, between uh, in among. Uh, Muslims and non-Muslims and initiated dialogue between them. So the artwork itself has managed to open up spaces for discussion and introduction and explanation about Islam and, you know, uh, uh, things related to spirituality. And for your second question, um, whether um, uh, this of artworks uh, is uh, Islamic art, modern and postmodern Islamic art, whether they are the mainstream or uh, marginalized. Um, it uh, for in during the 1970s and 1980s, it was uh, the 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 trend uh, and the main concern uh, of many Muslim artists. Uh, but as I have explained earlier, um, and in fact, uh, many uh, art historians, uh, Muslim art historians have commented that there has been a decrease uh, in the interest of Islamic art uh, in contemporary times, uh, using contemporary, uh, contemporary uh, means nowadays. Uh, so that is definitely something uh, that we need to look into. And perhaps uh, also to identify why uh, there is this problem. Perhaps uh, some artists felt a bit restricted um, and unable to um, successfully um, employ uh, postmodern uh, expressions uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, with, uh, for Islamic purposes, perhaps. Or perhaps there are some uh, disconnection between the two, inshallah. Ah, but uh, but um, but uh, inshallah, I think uh, if we look further into this, we will find that uh, th there are rooms for um, um, for the uh, the two to be uh, harmonized. And in fact, what should be considered is the uh, higher purpose of art, 
what is the higher purpose uh, of art and how could it benefit uh, without restricting uh, to simply traditional uh, forms. I think that's one of the things that we have to consider about. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Stasika. I have a short question that I wrote very fast. <laughs> so, Sister Sharifa, as, as we all see that now, so many Arabs coming and staying in Malaysia, especially from their mom. I just know last year that the Yemenis have a one-year visa uh, by, by, by the blessing of our government. So, do you think that this phenomena will dilute the concept of Halul Bayit in Malaysia among the respect <laughs> for this? Well, not all Yemens are from the prophetic lineage. Ah, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so, they, they will be selective, but they will, uh, there's no problem of Arabs to assimilate with Malay and Malay doesn't really like uh, give high respect to them as compared to Chinese Muslim or Indian Muslim. So, they have problems uh, to be recognized as the the same level as Malay Muslim. So this Arab, they don't really have, a big, especially when they have relatives even staying in Malaysia since long ago. So whether this can, uh, the other bait, no, the other bait is just some concept which is not only, which is not applicable to all Yemen, but maybe cultural, cultural, religious, cultural activities that, um, uh, you know, uh, celebrate Maulid, uh, how uh, this culture perhaps uh, may increase. And eventually, I mean, uh, partly, uh, it will help to promote the idea of other fitness. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is Jackie still there? Jack, are you still there? Okay, uh, Jackie. Uh, my simple question is that, do you feel threatened with this Brunei uh, effort now to become fully Islamized? I mean, their effort, although they are not going to do it, but all their campaign, I think, is more rigorous than before. I mean, as observer, as an as outsider, or as a non-Muslim, how, how do you look at it? Sorry, uh, because uh, it's not clear. Can you ask again? Okay? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, we, we can see lately for the past three years or two, three years, uh, uh, the Sultan of Brunei is rigorous mm. um, in this all this Islamization quote unquote, mm. uh, yeah. uh, effort. As an outsider, as, as, as a non Muslim, as non Brunei, how do you see that? Is it threatening? Yeah. Uh, it's quite a uh, how to describe it that uh, and most nearly for night we regard it as a kind of a uh, national philosophy, but they uh, some of the open mind uh, most nearly for night would regard it as a kind of a uh, cultural uh, tool to control the society because uh, you uh, you know that some for night people uh, will study abroad. Uh, for example, pretend, and then they uh, well, they come back to Brunei and they discover that uh, it might be a uh, national philosophy. On, on one hand, it shared to the national identity. On the other hand, they would choose that it's quite, quite stressful uh, to the uh, daily life because they choose they that uh, Brunei government uh, likely want to protect the, the monarchy uh, image or even the, uh, the power. But uh, recently, there are some uh, Brunei, uh, Malay, even Malay people, also true that uh, the question of MIP may cause some uh, instability in Brunei among uh, Malay and non-Malay people. In uh, non among the non-Malay people, uh, such as Chinese people, a lot of Chinese people immigrate to other country for a better life. But even recently, some Malay people also choose to immigrate to uh, overseas for a better life. But uh, it, it depends on, on where, how you can uh, uh, regard on the this uh, national philosophy. But uh, to the overseas Brunelian, they will uh, think that uh, this is their uh, collective mem memory to their family. They uh, sometimes were part of this memory. But on the other hand, they would uh, sometimes... Uh, uh, would be uh, more stressful while they are thinking of the uh, 
different condition on the environment in Brunei uh, between past and present. Okay. I think that's all our, our time for for today. We still have some comment uh, comment from uh, Prof. Nikias and Prof. Nurudin. But we can take it later uh, as personally. So uh, for closing, uh, we invite first Sister Fika and then Sister Sharifa and then Jack to say a few words, maybe two, three minutes each. Including Rima. Sister Fika with you first. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, I'll make it short, inshallah. I think um, the most important thing, I guess, for an art practitioner or in understanding Islamic art is to identify the higher purpose for art because uh, art generally uh, is, uh, employs a universal language and it represents Islam as a un uh, in its universal value. Uh, so to restrict um, Islamic art uh, to one form uh, will not be healthy. Uh, for the growth of a civilization and society. Uh, so there needs to be um, more effort uh, between uh, art experts and Islamic scholars um, to identify these higher purposes and then to see how uh, they can uh, develop uh, these practices for the artists, inshallah. Hmm. Sarifa. All right, uh, before I conclude, I would like to address uh, the Nur, Brother Nuruddin's. Actually, um, they give this Kamudi, my observation might be wrong, they give less attention to Indian, Chinese, or honestly Muslim, uh, less attention. I mean, they don't really consider it like uh, they give more focus on Malay Muslim. So if you ask non-Muslims, of course, as if there is no... Uh, that discussion on what is the fate of non Muslims, something like that. Right. So for Prof. Uh, Imtiaz, the sociological reason for this is most concept of Ahlul Bayt that comes to the Southeast Asia, especially Malaysia, Indonesia, comes from the Hadramaut people, I mean the Sayyid from Hadramaut. The Hadramaut society is a stratified society. They have these levels of Sayyid is the first and the second is the uh, um, uh, Sayyid and then uh, what Sheikh, Sheikh is the second so this stratified kind of uh, culture is brought here that is uh, based, uh, based on sociological uh, reason so my concluding mark is organizational analysis of Kamudi reveals that ethnic and religion plays important role in Malaysian identity formation this Malay Muslim identity now that it has added value of Islamic Ahlul Bayt, in one way or another, influences the way they relate to other Malaysian Muslims politically, socially, and religiously. That's all. Becky, your final word? There. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Stefika, Stefika, uh, Brother Jackie, for a very 